thanks for joining us on this webinar on Empathy and Emotions in Morality, Communication, and Human Life, co-hosted by the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and by the Department of Psychology at the University of Notre Dame. This webinar will consist of interdisciplinary talks of about 25 minutes, followed by 15-minute discussions. And please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Darshan Arvais, Professor of Psychology at Notre Dame, whose talk is titled, Ethogenesis, Darwin's Moral Sense, Early Experience and Moral Mindsets. Make sure you uh, mute your microphone unless you're speaking, or else we get all sorts of feedback, right? Okay, so uh, pleasure to be with you all. I'm, I'm, my, um, I'm here in the corner, I think, under Julie Ve Vecchio's uh, sign-in, but you see my PowerPoint, and so I'm going to focus there. Um, I have to use the right computer, though. Let's see. Okay, so... Empathy. We're talking about empathy today. Uh, I use a transdisciplinary approach to thinking about morality and human well-being. And uh, one of the pieces I uh, adopt or adapt into my work is Darwin's view of the moral sense. He came up with this idea when Herbert Spencer uh, noted, uh, well, argued and later changed his mind, but he said, oh, human evolution, that's all about, uh, you know, it's essentially the survival of the gene and before gene talk was available, but it was uh, humans evolved to be selfish. Uh, and so Darwin said, what? Uh, and looked through uh, the tree of life and found all these characteristics uh, that uh, other animals display that culminate in human morality. So it's social pleasure, uh, loving to be with other people, other people, other uh, uh, conspecifics. Empathy is part of that. Memory, using your memory to fit into society, being concerned for the opinion of others, and controlling and building habits to fit in. And we could add higher consciousness because if we look at nomadic foraging peoples who represent 99% of our history as a human genus, um, we see they have all these characteristics. And Darwin noted, however, uh, that they were available or present in uh, pre-civilized societies, but not so much in Britain. And I've argued elsewhere in this article, uh, chapter, that they've actually been decreasing in the United States, as we can see from the data of various kinds. So what's going on? Why would we diminish in our human sense? Well, Darwin thought that uh, this was something we inherited well, we have to really understand that maybe it's not inherited so much as constructed. So we, under, we need to understand who we are as human beings, what do we need uh, to thrive, survive, thrive, reproduce, uh, to flourish, to optimize our functioning. Well, we know we're animals, we need nourishment and warmth, but that's not enough for a mammal. Mammals also need affection and play to grow their brains well, which I'll show you in a moment. And we're social mammals, so we need extensive bonding with a primary caregiver, and with a community that supports both the mother and, and the child. And it turns out that we're really biosocially constructed by caregiver treatment and by our early experience. I'll give you a couple examples in a moment. So uh, if you look at our, uh, compare our needs at birth with those of other hominids and see how immature we are, look at the bottom line there, and you can see that we're, uh, our brain volume at birth is much smaller, this is full-term birth, 40 to 42 weeks. Lots of children now are born before that time. Uh, the eruption of the first tooth is a signal of cognitive development, and the last uh, tooth, permanent tooth, is of um, physical development, although neuroscientists tell us now that uh, students, I mean, sorry, kids really don't develop into adults till about age 30. Uh, so it's much longer uh, that we need supportive environments to uh, shape ourselves and breastfeeding is part of that, you can see, and, and I'll keep going. So we're really born uh, not 18 months early compared to other animals. We can't get up after a couple hours and walk around and feed ourselves, right? It takes a long time. So there's so many things that are unfinished yet when we're born as human beings. And so uh, it matters what happens after birth. And so every animal has a nest. We have a nest too. Ours is very intensive. 
it's matched up, developed, evolved to match up with the needs of that offspring uh, in a species typical manner. And we see from our uh, ethological studies that those animals that receive their species typical developmental system or nest end up being species typical creatures. Uh, they, they grow into more effective, intelligent creatures. So what does our nest look like? Well, ours is quite intensive. It's uh, provisioned by a community, not just by mother or mother and father or um, a, a single parent or a family, nuclear family. But these are things that the community provides. These are 30 to 40 million years old because they emerge mostly with the social mammals and they involve soothing perinatal experiences. So no separation of mom and baby, no painful procedures. Uh, every one of them, we now have neuroscientific evidence for their importance for uh, shaping the way the brain works, the body works. And I'll give you examples in a, in a moment. Uh, positive touch pretty much constantly helps the baby grow well, et cetera. Responsiveness to the needs of the child, uh, meeting their needs without distressing them, getting them into a distressful state. So you wanna keep the child at an optimal arousal level <clears throat> so that while the brain is finishing itself, the body's endocrine systems and so on, they're in a, in a uh, state of, of uh, growth instead of distress and self-protection. <clears throat> Breastfeeding, uh, this is always a shocker, two to five years. Well, that's because it takes about that much time for the immune system to finish itself. And uh, the breast milk has all the immunoglobulins you need to develop, <clears throat> excuse me, to develop that immune system. Allo parents, allo mothers, other mothers uh, who care for the uh, child responsibly, that's part of our heritage, kind of unique among social mammals. And then play, lots of free play, self-directed play, helps the brain grow, the executive functions, for hours on each of these, but, uh, and then social support. So have a, having a sense of, of being supported by the community helps the mother be responsive, helps the child feel uh, like they belong and helps them then grow properly. So all these um, uh, components are related to self-regulation, which is important for empathy development and empathy expression, as we know from uh, Dan Batts' work, especially so what do we know then, uh, just to go say more about this, we're biosocial constructions, we're dynamic systems, so the early uh, functioning of a system matters for what trajectory uh, it takes, and so it's going to affect who we become, uh, how we're uh, treated, and how we experience the world early affects how everything gets set up. So there's this constructive interactionism and a constant interaction every second between nature and nurture, which you really can't separate. And there's epigenetic effects for all systems going on continuously, sensitive periods happening and passing. And so this includes every physiological system and the emotion systems and the sense of self and uh, <coughs> social connection. So if we look at responsivity, this is the most well studied in psychology. Here's just a, a little more detail on that. Sensitive, responsive care establishes brain wiring. It's uh, the emotion regulation, trajectory for all sorts of habitual patterns. And it means that it's a relational synchrony between the caregiver and the child. So their, their emotions are, are communicating properly. Their uh, cognitive expressions of meaning are shaped and, uh, by each other. There's a mutuality about it, so intersubjectivity. Um, and at the brain level, it's a limbic resonance between the two brains and they're mutually co-regulating and it's been called this external umbilical cord. One example of what's happening is the vagus nerve is tuned up, or, or not, it's uh, under poor care. But the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve. It connects to all major body systems, the cardiac system, respiratory immune system, emotion, emotional systems as well, and digestive. And if it doesn't get set properly, you can have lifelong problems with one or more of these areas. So poor vagal tone. Uh, results then from non-responsive parenting. That means the child was let to get too distressed out of optimum functioning while the vagus nerve is setting itself. And so that child just cannot um, regulate in one or more of these systems. Uh, and it's also related to the capacity for intimacy. So if you get too distressed getting close to someone else, you're, you're gonna have a hard time having much intimate contact. 
and it's been related also to compassion. So you have to be able to control your own distress in order to act in a compassionate manner. Mutually responsive orientations then, um, plus secure attachment, well, they mutually responsive orientations foster secure attachment, and they both together then predict empathy in multiple studies, self-regulation, which is important for empathy, and then other forms of moral functioning like conscience and being open to others and the sense of self-efficacy in social situations. What's happening in the early uh, days then of a responsive uh, dyad of mother and child or father and child, caregiver and child, these are the postnatal experiences that I, uh, I've suggested uh, foster an empathic, deep empathic, what I call effectivity core, the sense of being both empathic but also effective at uh, knowing uh, or, uh, the body and the neurobiology know how to be empathic in some very subliminal subconscious ways. Uh, and so the child is experiencing the presence of the caregiver. That means emotional presence, uh, not distracted or dissociated, but there. A sense of reverence toward the child that they are special, unique, uh, and uh, they have a, a, a way of growing uh, in their own way. Intersubjectivity, which I mentioned, they experience empathy from the caregiver. They take perspectives as they build games and back and forth interactions with one another. And this develops a deep sense of social pleasure. It's great to be around mom, great to be around dad, for example. And they build what they practice is actually what they become. So they're practicing all this, they're immersed in it. And then they build the pleasurable uh, the systems, the neurobiological systems that are, that. Um, that are capable as well, effective, and that leads to this um, kind of deep empathy. What's really happening in those early years, or one of the key things that Alan Chores documented in so many books of his, that the right hemisphere is developing from that mutual responsiveness. It's self-regulation, so it's uh, right hemisphere is, uh, grows more rapidly in the first years of life, and it at that time governs self-regulation systems, including the vagus nerve but also emotional intelligence and empathy and other capacities for actually being and feeling connected. So what happens in my view, this is just an illustration of it, is the child develops these deep empathic effectivity roots. And then when, when they move into their autonomy um, testing at age two uh, or past age two, actually, uh, they, that autonomy space is, is corralled by their empathy. So they don't do things that are uh, horrible to other people because they have a deep sense of empathy. And then as uh, their abstract thinking develops, they also then their moral imagination is also uh, rooted in empathy. So what happens with good care is uh, we're born with these survival systems in the older parts of the brain, the anger, fear, these have all been mapped in mammal brains. These are innate, they keep us alive. And what happens with good development is you um, develop executive functions that control those systems. They're able to, you know, you might panic when a, a cougar comes in the room, you know, or you think it's a cougar, right? But the, uh, it's not a cougar. And so your executive functions then say, oh, calm down. That was just a shadow. And they're able to um, uh, keep you pretty much in that optimal way of functioning. And you grow well the mammalian aspects of your um, brain, which develop after birth. So that sense of caring, how to care and what that means and the social pleasure I was talking about, the ability to play, to be responsive in uh, social play. And you spend your life there. And that's what we see in the small band hunter gatherers, the nomadic foragers that I use as a baseline. This is how they spend their lives primarily. And if we zero in on what I call mindsets, the Buddhists would call these selves, uh, you spend more of your time in an engagement ethic, that, uh, which I, is really a broad definition of empathy for me, which is full presence in the moment, intersubjectivity, resonating with the other, an I-thou orientation, egalitarian, and you spend your, your life there in face-to-face -face moments, and then on the right, the communal imagination, when you use your abstract thinking, it's building on those capacities for engagement. So you have a sense of connection to the larger whole, the web of life, and you show and plan for egalitarian respect and <coughs> sympathetic action and so on. So um, I have to rush through this, so keep going. 
Um, all right, so this is our heritage, you know, this kind of experience in early life, lots of touch, responsiveness, uh, but we have, in the states in particular, have moved to a society that treats children more like this, lots of physical isolation, and even non-responsiveness is encouraged with sleep training and so on, and we have now, we know the science tells us that's not a good thing. So let's, uh, what happens then when a developmental system or nest is degraded? Well, you shouldn't be surprised if you have a species atypical developmental system or nest, that you're gonna have a species atypical outcome, an individual that's really outside the evolved range of intelligence and effectiveness. So let's look at touch then as one example of what happens when it's missing. We know that physical closeness and affectionate touch is really important for a mammal to grow and synthesize DNA. You separate an offspring from the mother, all sorts of systems get dysregulated, and uh, that includes growing. The growth hormone slows down. DNA synthesis slows down. And so what happens over time is this dysregulates multiple systems that are setting the parameters and thresholds, and then over the life uh, course, these uh, um, individuals are more stress reactive, they're more impulsive, poor uh, chance uh, of being depressed. A recent study um, noted that they tested, they asked moms to keep diaries at age four months about how much their, their baby was being held. And they looked at the children later on, many years later, and they noticed that the children who had less touch at the molecular level looked developmentally delayed. So it's not, um, well, I have a picture in a moment to show you that. So physical separation then is also, is not only affecting growth at the moment, it's increasing pain in the child. So it, uh, the pain response increases, endogenous op opioids, which are kind of our addictive to relationships piece of our physiology that's supposed to be developing at that time decreased oxytocin system doesn't get set properly. We see that from uh, orphans in Romania. Um, and there's lasting epigenetic effects. So as it's, there are sensitive periods for things and Michael Meany's lab has done enormous amounts of uh, many studies on this showing that uh, the equivalent is for a six month, first six months of a human, first 10 days of, of life for a rat who don't, don't have a high nurturing mother, uh, that's, too bad because the rest of your life uh, you are going to be anxious because the genes that are supposed to be turned on to control anxiety don't get turned on with low nurturing. And this, it's a similar effect for humans uh, in those first six months. So touch really matters here. And uh, this is sort of, a, I like this example of the brain. The left is normal brain. The right is a brain that's been overly stressed. And you can see there's fewer synapses, fewer connections on the neurons. That's what happens if you leave a baby to cry. The cortisol levels get so high that they melt synapses. And of course, the things that are supposed to be growing don't grow as well. So what happens um, overall is the physiology is malformed in all these systems. You can see uh, the image there on the right is a three, uh, two three-year-old brains, the normal size brain, um, a sagittal uh, view, and um, uh, the right is an extremely neglected three-year-old's brain. You see the touch then really matters here. Responsiveness uh, is actually very physically visible. So the child grows up with a sense that something's not right. Feeling, uh, this is from Jean Wiegloff's uh, continuum concept. She was an accidental anthropologist really, and uh, this is a nice way to put what the difference is. So. For a child who's been responded to and carried and receives the nest, the feeling appropriate to an infant in arms is this feeling of rightness or essential goodness. Mm -hmm. The premise that he's right, good, and welcome. Without that conviction, a human being of any age is crippled by a lack of confidence, a full sense of self, of spontaneity, of grace. So this is focusing on the self um, that's displayed. And, and if you don't have a well-developed self, uh, that confidence, it's really hard to be empathic. It's really hard to connect to others. And the um, Dalai Lama, when he first came to the United States, he said, what's wrong with everybody? <laughs> because he's, he noted that they didn't have this uh, kind of confidence, the spontaneity and grace that he expected a human to have. So instead of functioning this way, when your early life 
um, is toxically stressful and you, you're left alone a lot, you get lots of pain and uh, distress, you, your brain then learns to function a different way. You're more stress reactive. When the stress response kicks in, it changes the blood flow in your body. There's nothing much you can do about it except learn not to be stressed, right? But the blood flow shifts away from your higher order thinking to your muscles and mobilizes you for self-protection. And so you get very self-oriented, uh, just necessarily, that's what happens. And if in early life you've been toxically stressed, you don't grow your prosociality. So your ability to care for others, your empathy, your empathy roots then are um, now um, set. They're not set properly. So, and this is what I talk about, mindsets or selves, right? You spend your life face-to-face -face in social opposition or social withdrawals. You try to dominate the other in some fashion, feel better than them or you just withdraw and you don't express yourself at all. And then at the bottom, it's, it just relates to how you use your abstract thinking. So if you're used to, you know, having to, you know, defend yourself, be aggressive to just feel okay, you're going to use your imagination then to also control others in some fashion. If you've used, uh, you're used to withdrawing, you dissociate from your emotions, then you're more likely to use this detached imagination, uh, uh, emotionally detached intellect, which the wisdom tradition would say is very dangerous. Um, and so you sp in, in, you're attracted to stories and narratives that help you justify your, your physiological reactions. So when you come to a situation, you are either going to, um, this is neuroception, you come and you, you have a, a sense of uh, whether you're safe or not safe, right? So you go, if you feel safe, you're gonna go into this approach orientation, what I call engagement. If you, if you feel unsafe, though, you're going to go into a defensive mode. So that's the bottom part of the picture. At the top, though, your stories can put you in these modes. So if you think green people are dangerous and you see a green person, you're going to go into your safety defense, right? Because you've learned to feel safe by having a script like that, an external kind of thing to hang on to, because inside you have a very um, primally wounded self. You don't know who you are. So going to spend a lot of time on the right side of the diagram when you don't get that evolved nest. You're going to feel that the world's not safe. I can't trust my feelings. My, you know, you learned in the early life that expressing yourself didn't work. So you're going to not trust those uh, intuitions. You can't trust people. All these things are going to be misdeveloped. And when these things are kind of the way you're oriented, your empathy is going to be affected. You have to have a good sense of self, a well-established neurobiology in order to be empathic in the way that I have uh, described briefly. In our studies, we, we find that the nest here is the EDNPR down on the left. So we find that it's related. The, the amount of, of nest provision the child, three to five-year-old child has had in the last week is related to these uh, social maladaptation, what we call this combination of things on the right. Uh, so these are things that are opposite of empathy. Um, and then uh, the next one, this is in the United States. We have uh, fi similar findings in China and, and Switzerland. Uh, again, the nest on the left, and then moral socialization is what we call those four things on the right, which includes empathy. These are constant measures <clears throat> of, uh, that are used for young children that the mother reports on. <clears throat> and then what we think is really the the more optimal way of being with others, the sociality, uh, a deeper sense of empathy, is this, these things on the right, based in trion ethics uh, theory that I was sort of describing earlier without naming it that way. So what I think has happened is we've shifted our baselines on child raising practices, and then we, we just assume whatever is coming out as a psychosocial neurobiology is normal, and then the adults that we see from that misdevelopment is normal, and then the culture that supports such misdirection continues. And so what we're in now, I think, is a cycle of competitive detachment where we provide undercare to young children and poor development of their biosocial neuropsychology or biology. And then the adults are really not well, and they're not going to be very morally oriented in terms of being engaged and empathic and holistically um, virtuous. And you, they keep a culture going where they're distracted, overwhelmed, or over controlling, and so it continues. And I think we're spiraling in the wrong direction still. 
And it's really a sign of social poverty. We're all concerned about economic wealth, but at, at the expense now of social wealth and ecological wealth. And so there's a viciousness that's um, being perpetuated uh, in all these areas and in the cycle we're in. But this is our heritage. Our heritage is to provide companionship caregiving, which leads to good psychosocial neurobiology, adults that are well and wise, and a community that attends to the basic needs of its members, which is uh, providing that companionship. So I have to stop here. And uh, the book that describes a lot of this is on the right there. It's won a couple prizes. So um, I, uh, if you have questions, uh, you know, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Darsha. Uh, we will take our first question from one of our keynote speakers. And uh, then we will open the floor. Uh, keynote speakers, make sure you are unmuted when you begin talking. In the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you can unmute yourself. Michael, go ahead. Chris, oh, hi. Are you calling up people or should I? Yeah, how should we work this? You can do it, Darsha. Okay, I see Michael. Okay. Hi. Uh, hi. This seems to be working. This is great. Uh, fascinating talk. Uh, and, you know, since we're doing this interdisciplinary thing, I want to push you a little on the sort of philosophical foundations of it. Now, it, it happens to be the case that I agree with you that this kind of ideal human life really is ideal, this kind of species typical sociality. But not everyone agrees with us. And I don't think species typicality can do the work of convincing them that this is good. So, you know, there have been plenty of the, the two bad outcomes you describe of, of social opposition and social withdrawal. There have been plenty of warrior cultures, you know, uh, I think of the ancient Spartans or something like that, who think that the goal of raising children is to get that, them into that social oppositional mindset so they're great warriors. And then, of course, there are plenty of ascetic cultures that may not think that social withdrawal is ideal for everyone, but that do valorize the emotionally detached intellect, that think social withdrawal <clears throat> it, it, a, a monastic culture or a philosophical culture. I think about Aristotle's comparison between flourishing in the city and flourishing as an isolated philosopher. And he says the first one's more human, but the second one is divine. And there's something about transcending the species typical human that's required for real excellence. So what you describe is overextended seeking or striving, trying to transcend the species typical, might, according to some accounts, if they really value, you know, sort of warrior virtues or philosophical or mon monastic virtues, they might argue that those really are the best ways to be and that we should be thinking about how to structure our child rearing culture to encourage those kind of mm -hmm. virtues and not the virtues that soft non-philosophical people like you and me might like. So I, I, I'm wondering how you respond to, to those who reject your ideal of human flourishing. Yeah, I uh, didn't bring all my transdisciplinariness here. <laughs> but one of the big pieces is a look at what we've done to the planet in our, uh, all the rest of the species and uh, we are, on the cliff, going over the cliff here, we've, you know, spread toxicity everywhere, global warming, uh, species, half of them are uh, gone from the, in the last 50 years. Um, and so I take a planetary view that we are part of the bio community and uh, the detached way of being, whether it's aesthetic or philosophical or this domineering kind of way of being, which come out of hierarchical institutions essentially mm -hmm, mm -hmm. after the 99% of our genus history. Um, but when you, you can see the results. So I'm doing this in a kind of yelling fire, red light, red light, you know, we got to do something. What's wrong with us? How did we get here? And so this is the, how I come up with, uh, this is the theory of why we've gone off the rail, what's normal and get us back to at least some form of the baseline. 
No, it doesn't mean that there aren't <clears throat> people. I mean, you, you use the intellect judiciously with, uh, you know, don't spend your life in the intellect, but using it when it's important. Um, and we, uh, professors, of course, do this all the time, but it's right, right. It, it, it sounds like life you're for, kind of well integrated, emotionally uh, integrated <laughs> person isn't, you know, if my goal were to make sure my child is raised to be the most successful academic possible, that would be a, a, a very different form of child rearing than the one that you're advocating. And there are all sorts of different human ideals that might be at odds with, with the one that you're advocating. Yeah, so I'm advocating for the flourishing of all the, the bio community. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. don't take that as important if you think it's fine for humans to just think about themselves and be anthropocentric and destroy everything around them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean, we, this is a longer conversation to have, but uh, those are my, I have baselines there too, but I didn't have time to go through everything. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. I'm, I'm just wondering, can it, first of all, can anyone hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. good. All right. I'm just wondering about uh, Darsh's idea that um, the ways that diverge from her ideal uh, are bad for the other species of the planet and for the planet itself. Um, someone might say that that's a consequentialistic argument and that what's good for the planet has to be weighed against what's good or admirable for, for individuals. So I don't think it's a decisive argument that uh, the, the way we're re raising children now and the lack of the ideal that Darsha talks about, that this is somehow uh, uh, less, than, less than ideal and that the ideal uh, has to be uh, along her lines. Uh, so I, in a way I'm backing what, what Michael says. And I think that to argue that it's bad for the planet doesn't quite do the job of showing that your ideal really is the ideal. Right, I know it needs more detail. Um, so I, uh, if you look at the small band hunter gatherers, you look at societies that hold the indigenous worldview, which is that we are one among many um, sentient beings. And our <coughs> responsibility is to keep things going in our, you know, because we rely on the earth so closely in these societies, <clears throat> you want to worry about the flourishing of the all. And because the right hemisphere is well developed, you have a sense that you're all connected anyway, and you're all kind of one common self. Uh, and in those uh, groups, they, they know their landscape so well. They know, they take the mindset of the animals and the trees, and they, they have a sense of being able to move in and out of different kind of selves and, and perspectives, and multi-perspective taking. So it's not the, just saying the planet. I know it's just too big and too, too vague. Uh, but in these uh, sustainable societies, they're very much wedded into and rooted into the landscape and have deep affection for it and empathy for it. So that's what I'm really talking about, which I didn't have time to get into. Okay. Are we, yes. Am I audible to uh, people elsewhere without a dedicated mic? How do we yes. change the camera? Okay. Robert Audi speaking, yeah. and I'll start with a very short remark on the past two questions in relation to what Darsha was saying. As I see it, her account of the importance of the elements in development is compatible with any number of ideals being, um, shall we say, engendered and developed uh, after early childhood. So I would have said uh, initially, that the moral development theory of early childhood is neutral with respect to a number of the ideals we want to make room for. My actual question was how important it is that mothers give the kind of care that you think crucial, because we're in an age when uh, two jobs uh, are crucial for many families. And so uh, one view would be we have to support uh, longer leaves during childhood for mothers or um, better funding for uh, good care if other caregivers can live up to the close relations you said are so important. Right, so in our ancestral context, uh, maybe 40% of the time the mother's caring for the child. It's other people, fathers, grandmothers, and actually uh, in some of the settings, 
20 to 40 year olds are going out doing the hunting and gathering. And it's the older people that are caring for the children most of the time. And breastfeeding was shared uh, when needed among the other women in the community. So yes, it's much more of a communal thing, but somebody, and there's been some research showing that three people ideally are, uh, need to be in love with that child and that's help, helps them flourish. And it doesn't matter who they are, right? So as long as, as, long as you can get breast milk to them, I would say, uh, in some fashion, uh, it's, it's much more fluid and complex than uh, just simple. Thanks. Okay, I want to jump in here too. Uh, Nancy Snow here. Can people hear me? Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. Well, Darsha, at this point, I think you have a unified wall of philosophers against you. Um, because I'm going to jump on the bandwagon here with Bob Audi and Michael Sloten, Michael Frazier, and say that I think, uh, as Bob put it, your, uh, your early childhood development scheme is compatible with a number of ideals, not just the one that you've uh, talked about. It might be incompatible with a warrior ideal, but I could certainly see the compatibility with monastic ideals. Uh, so I, and I, I guess I'm not sure about the, the role of empathy in all of this. Um, uh, but I guess my, my, my real question was uh, uh, about the smothering possibility uh, that, that might come up. up, up, up. Um, you, know, you have developed a, an early childhood approach to counter the sort of lack of engagement. But what happens if you've got three or more adults doting on a child? Uh, is that child's autonomy going to be stunted? What's going to happen with that? And certainly we're in, a, we're in a position now where we can't go back to the same dynamic as uh, small band hunter-gatherers. So what are we supposed to do, given the, the intervening historical eras that uh, we're facing and the present situation? Right, so in terms of uh, smothering, right, uh, we're not talking about that. So companionship caregiving is not the intrusive type of caregiving that we know uh, undermines the autonomy of the child. One illustration is um, one of my students' friends was in Africa sitting around a fire in a village, and uh, one of the young children put their hand into the fire, started to put their hand towards the fire, and this American slapped the hand away, oh, and then the elder in the village said, shouldn't be doing that, you'll have to do that for the rest of their lives, right? So that kind of autonomy, there's uh, other indigenous worldviews, everyone's got their own way of growing and being, and you pretty much stay out of the way, uh, unless there's some, you know, dangerous uh, sudden thing. So, so what was that, uh, just sorry. <laughs> it's not attentiveness or intrusiveness. There's a middle ground there, depending on the age of the child and all. Okay, right? I'm having a bit of a hard time here with the example. Uh, what was the American supposed to have done? Let the child find out that that, that would not feel good. <laughs> See, we have a hard time understanding. <laughs> you the kids the time. Oh no, it's dangerous. So anyway. I have a bit of a problem with that, I'm afraid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so in, uh, the anthropologists show that two-year-olds have machetes and they're, you know, playing with a machete and things like that. So this is part of the free range childhood thing that is a movement now in the States because parents have gotten so anxious and so controlling. So, I mean, there's some balance in there, depends on the age of the child. So I, all the stuff I'm saying is very, you know, just the tip of the iceberg on all the depth that has to be described. But I, think we need, I think we need a middle ground here. I think we need, that's kind of what I'm, I'm asking you to provide, right? Is, uh, you know, some idea of what this companionship ca caring might be uh, that doesn't kind of go to the other side. And I'm sure that a lot of this is culturally, you know, uh, variable. Um, in, in our day and age and over here where you might say, well, we don't want the kids putting their hands in fires. We also don't want two-year-olds riding their tricycles in the streets. Um, we don't want them to experience pain by being hit by a car, that sort of thing. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, this is all the nuances that a, a wise parent would have to deal with, but they, they're now moving into playgrounds that have fires in them that, that are dangerous because <laughs> doing to kids, and that's starting in Britain, and they're, they're coming over here, uh, where you have, uh, you know, old cars or something, so they can learn how to take risks. Part of the problem, I think John Hyde has a new book out on this, uh, um, Cobbling Children, right? And, uh, that the, the university students are coming in, and they, they're so scared of everything, and uh, 
what we need is the ability to let them go. Now, of course, running in the street is not a good idea. So it's, I mean, there's things to work out. So um, you had the other question though. Can I can I follow up? I think this is this is Asia. I don't know if y'all can see me or hear me. Can I follow up on Nancy's question? Okay, great. Um, thanks, Darsha. Uh, really, really appreciate your work. Um, and really admire your work. Uh, but I wanted to ask. Um, uh, I, I like this idea of providing kind of a safe, secure, comfortable space, right, for children, um, and helping their development in that way. But I'm also wondering how resilience plays a role or what role resilience plays a role in your model. Um, I know this is really big, right, for a lot of folks uh, thinking about child development right now. Um, and it seems like in order for us to kind of develop skills of resilience, we have to suffer or, or we have to be um, insecure or, or something. And so I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the connection there. Yeah, uh, that idea of resilience, I think, is overused. Uh, so you hear it in movies, oh, kids are resilient, do what you want, parent, you know. Um, but as I pointed out, there's all sorts of neurobiological things that are establishing themselves. So if you're going to leave a baby to cry, which is a popular thing to do in the States, which is considered crazy by most societies, uh, leave them to cry uh, to themselves to sleep, you're going to pay the cost later for the rest of that child's life. So there's a way that when it's time, the child will let you know when they want to go sleep in their own bed. You know, it depends on the kid and, you know, you do it gently and you do it in ways that are not uh, so extremely stressful that they misdevelop. Mis so these are things that wise elders know how to do um, and we've lost most of them. Um, so resilience is used, I think, unfortunately, too much as an excuse, a uh, way to let off adult responsibility. Uh, or genes are used that way, oh, it's genetic, you know, oh, it's resilience, yeah, they're resilient. And so there's just like, pay attention to these neurobiological findings we know. Uh, Chuck Nelson from Harvard, who used to be at the University of Minnesota, uh, they reacted to the separation of families at the border. So we, the science is clear, this is terrible for kids. And yet we do it routinely in the United States with babies every night. So that's the thing we have to wake up. Why are we, why, why are all these stress-reactive people who are, you know, so angry at <laughs> others? The, the tribalism is promoted by the way we're treating our children. So there's a whole bunch of things that are affected by the way we're um, understanding child development or not. And yeah, I could go on. Sorry, I'm on my soapbox. <laughs> there's thank you. Thank you uh, so much for uh, answering our questions.